Thanks for listening to the Suzy Larson Life Podcast, available thanks to support from listeners like you. It's only just a matter of... Welcome to Suzy Larson Live. Always, always so honored to get to spend this time with you. In fact, I look forward to bringing you conversations every single day that hopefully inspire you in your faith walk, that deepen your understanding of God's Word, and that heightens your awareness of His very real presence in your life. Well, I'm taking the Fridays in December to walk through some content from my book, Prepare Him Room. It's an Advent devotional. Also, just we'll be drawing from stories from my history and some other places just really to help us create some space for Jesus. You know, it's just so easy to get caught in the hustle bustle of the season. I can't tell you over the years how many Christians who love Jesus so much that say, I can't wait for this season to get over so I can focus on Jesus again. And I totally get it because it's a it's a culture, isn't it? I mean, it moves so fast and the bent and the temptation to commercialize everything is significant. So you really have to hit the brakes. You really have to jump off of the fast track and travel at the pace of grace to say, you know what? This year is going to be different. So that's my hope in these Fridays is to help you take a deep breath in, exhale, and consider a different approach to your holiday season. Well, thanks to Bethany House Publishers, each Friday I've got a handful of copies of this book of mine, Prepare Him Room, to give away. And I ask you to read a chapter out of Luke's Gospel each day of Advent and then read the devotional. Now, I'm going to say this isn't a light read. I don't write fluff. I just don't. I like to go to the depths of things. And so I'm asking you to take some time and to create some space and to take some inventory of your soul. And as I mentioned last week, and you'll probably hear me feed this throughout uh, you know, each of these Friday shows, is that the temptation so much is to numb out during this season because we've accumulated sorrows, hurts, disappointments, and most people don't take the time to sort through those in light of God's love. And so the holiday season seems a perfect excuse to jump in with everybody else and numb out, drink too much, eat too much, spend too much, commit to too much, because everybody else is doing it, right? But what you don't realize is you're enforcing captivity. You're losing ground, not gaining ground. You're numbing your senses rather than sharpening your senses. So while I'm not trying to be a killjoy, I am inviting you to a better way because Jesus is your healer. Jesus is your defender. Whatever you need, whatever hurts you've endured, Jesus is the answer for those things. He's got strategy. He's got words of life for you. And that's why the enemy wants so much for us to numb out throughout the end of the year so that we wake up in the new year heavy, bogged down, full of regret. He loves to destroy our endings and our beginnings because they matter to us. Advent, as you know, or you may know, means coming, arrival. You know, it invites us to a season of prayer and fasting to anticipate not only or celebrate, I should say, the coming of Jesus that he came, but anticipate his soon return. And yet scripture does say that people will be given to revelry, drunkenness, and partying right up to the day of his return. It'll be as in the days of Noah. Now, how wicked did, did the times have to be, the cultures have to be, that they'd all have to be destroyed, except a fam? How wicked <laughs> does a culture have to be that there's just no hope other than to destroy them? I often say when wickedness and lawlessness thrives, it's the vulnerable that perish. But in the days of Noah, it was such an evil time. Sin was so rampant that the vulnerable suffered most of all. And why does scripture say it will be as in the days of Noah? Well, I think that times will get so tough, and are we seeing that in the last few years, the way things have escalated? Times will get so tough that people, the only way they'll know to cope is to party, is to numb out, is to do whatever they can do to not feel what they're feeling and face what they're facing. But Jesus is the hope of the earth. I don't want us to use the holiday season as an excuse or an opportunity to escape our pain because it's precisely the time to bring our very real pain to a very real God. And I would submit to you that it takes great maturity 
to embrace holy contentment and holy expectancy simultaneously. What I mean by that is to say, here is where I am. My life's probably different than I wished or hoped it would be, but this is what it is. But I have a Savior. I have a hope. I'm not camping in my circumstances. You hear me say this a lot. There's a big difference between surrendering to your circumstances and surrendering to God in your circumstances. To surrender to your circumstances is to say, you know, this kind of thing runs in the family, or there, there's no hope for me. It'll always be this way. It's always how it goes for me. That's surrendering to your circumstances, and it's truly believing a lie. Surrendering to God in your circumstances is to say, this place doesn't define me. I don't care if this runs in my family. I'm going to be a cycle breaker because I serve a promise keeper. I will have hope. I will always have hope. Our hearts can't live without hope. Maybe you heard me tell this story once, but uh, I remember lamenting to God. Just It was probably a, a thin line between lament and self-pity. I was vacillating over into the wrong lane into oncoming traffic because I was so frustrated by uh, the slow progress of my health, and I just felt crummy more than I felt well. And I just cried out to God, and I quoted the scripture back to him, God, I'm heart sick. And the, the, the verse I'm thinking of, maybe you know it, is a hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a promise fulfilled is a tree of life. And I said, I'm heart sick. You know, you're taking so long to heal me, and I don't know what to do. You're being so quiet. I don't know what to do. And the Lord pressed upon my heart, look it up. So I looked it up. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. The word deferred is a verb. It's an action word. Um, God's not ever. He never takes hope away from us. We're the ones who put hope aside. So let's say you have a loan and you decide to defer the payment. You're kicking the can down the field for another time, a more opportune time. Well, that's what the enemy wants us to do with our hope, to go, I can't have hope now. I have seen no reason for hope. So you postpone hope. You defer hope. And guess what happens? It makes your heart sick. Your heart live, can't live without hope. And uh, a promise fulfilled is the tree of life. And that's why to live with this divine contentment to say, I'm not thanking you for these trials, but I am thanking you in them. But I am not letting go of hope because one day I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. We celebrate Christmas because we celebrate Christ, the Christ of Christmas, Jesus, who set down his robe, who entered the cosmos, crawled into the womb of a virgin teenage girl, born into poverty where animals lay, made his appearance on earth, and lived a sinless life amidst mockery and torture and persecution and religious bullies. He did all of it with a heart of purity and strength of conviction, and he did it for us. He faced what we face, and then he went to the cross to die our death. And then he blew the doors off of death's claim on us so that we could know for certain we will live forever with him in eternity if we trust him. This is a, a reading from an old out-of-print book, The Glory of Christmas. It's one of my favorites, and it's a compilation of, of writings from Chuck Swindoll, Max Lucado, and Chuck Colson. Listen to this from Max. I say Max like we're on first-name basis, but we are. He's been on the show a lot of times. I love him. I appreciate him so much. But this is by Max Lucado. Untethered by time, God sees us all. From the backwoods of Virginia to the business district of London, from the Vikings to the astronauts, from the cave dwellers to the kings, from the hut builders to the finger pointers to the rock stackers, he sees us. Vagabonds, ragamuffins, all. He saw us before we were born, and he loves what he sees. Flooded by emotion, overcome by pride, the star maker turns to us one by one and says, you are my child. I love you dearly. I'm aware that someday you'll turn from me and walk away, but I want you to know I've already provided a way back. And to prove it, he did something extraordinary. Stepping from the throne, he removed his robe of light and wrapped himself in skin, pigmented human skin. The light of the universe entered a dark, wet womb. He whom angels worship nestled himself in the placenta of a peasant, birthed into a cold night, then slept on cow's hay. Mary didn't know whether to give him milk or give him praise, but she gave him both since he was, as near as she could figure, hungry and holy. Joseph didn't know whether to call him junior or father, 
but in the end called him Jesus, since that's what the angel had said, and since he didn't have the faintest idea what to name a God he could cradle in his arms. Don't you think, their heads tilted and their minds wondered, what in the world are you doing, God? Or better phrased, God, what are you doing in the world? Can anything make me stop loving you, God asks? Watch me speak your language. Sleep on your earth. Feel your hurts. Behold the maker of sight and sound as he sneezes, coughs, and blows his nose. You wonder if I understand how you feel? Look into the dancing eyes of the kid in Nazareth. That's God walking to school. Ponder the toddler at Mary's table. That's God spilling his milk. You wonder how long my love will last? Find your answer on a splintered cross on a craggy hill. That's me you see up there, your maker, your God, nails stabbed and bleeding, covered in spit and sin-soaked. That's your sin I'm feeling. That's your death I'm dying. That's your resurrection I'm living. That's how much I love you. Beautiful, Max. Appreciate that so much. You know, Paul said, I want to know him more. And then he talked about the fellowship of his suffering and the power of his resurrection. I've been thinking a lot about that lately because aren't those the two places where we truly um, learn to know God more, experience him in a way that changes how we walk with him? There's fellowship in suffering with God. He's near to the brokenhearted. He saves those who are crushed in spirit. He says, a bruised reed I will not break, and a smoldering wick I will not snuff out. And then in the fellowship of the suffering and the resurrection, of his, the power res- of resurrection, to me that speaks of when things die, when dreams die, relationships die, and we stand at the grave of whatever died. And maybe parts of our flesh die, and it's so hard to face that there's still more of us that needs to be like more of him. But it's in those places of death and in the places of suffering where resurrection power rises up, where the comfort of the Holy Spirit presses in. We try to avoid these things at all costs, but aren't these the very places where we realize we're made for another world? Do you know that if you're in Christ Jesus, you're more spiritual than physical, that your name is written in the book of life, that God keeps really amazing records, and you're going to be blown away when you see what he rewards. You'll be just as blown away when you see what he's forgotten on your behalf. He's chosen to forget your sin. He's put it far from him as far as the east is from the west. As I wrote in my book, Closer Than Your Next Breath, though history may record our unflattering antics, Heaven remembers our faith, and heaven rewards our faith. So today I want to talk with you about the power of our participation in the great kingdom story and and the sometimes hard-to-understand ways of Jesus. This is why we've got to know him enough to trust him. We'll be back in a moment. This is Susie Larson, host of Susie Larson Live. Christmas is my favorite time of year. I remember back in our young years when we were struggling to make ends meet, and someone surprised us with bags of groceries and gifts under the tree. All these years later now, we love to surprise others who have a need. Maybe you know someone who has a need this Christmas. You can give hope to someone this Christmas this year by sharing their story at MyFaithRadio.com. Help us help them and be a blessing to someone this year on MyFaithRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in to Susie Larson Live. I'm so grateful to spend this time with you. In fact, I'm taking the Fridays out of this month to draw off some content from my Advent devotional, Prepare Him Room, and just from some past stories and other other places and spaces to really paint a picture of who Jesus is and why it is that we need to prepare him room, why he's worth it. He is worth it. He's worthy of our praise. He's worthy of the time and the space we give him. And isn't it just a marvel that the Father would love us so much that he would send his only son? And yet we as his people will run to and fro, especially in this season, and forget all about him, forget to have fellowship with him, forget to honor him. 
You know, it's like a child who who grows up and they suddenly are not grateful anymore for their parents' input and they shrug their shoulders thinking they know more than their parents and they wander off and they lose that sense of honor, of connection, of strength and community. And that's happening all the time. And I know there are plenty of brokenhearted parents listening today going, yeah, that's me. It makes me wonder how God must feel when his children do the very same thing, where we rush to and fro. And we forget that fellowship with him is the greatest gift of all, that even though he gives such incredible good gifts to his children, he's the best gift of all. Well, we've got a handful of copies of Prepare Him Room to give away, thanks to Bethany House Publishers, so you may know the drill, but if you don't, here it is. Text the word book to get in on the drawing. Text the word book to 877-933. 2484. Because our uh, listenership is growing by leaps and bounds all the time, if you're new to Faith Radio, you may wonder why that process. Well, when you text the word book, not in quotes, not with an exclamation point, not with any other words, just book, it'll kick back a link to you. And if you don't get a link back, it just means you may have added some extra uh, characters that don't belong there. Just book. It'll kick back a link And then you fill out the form. And why do you have to do that? Because we love to give resources away every single day. And we've got lots of listeners. And there's no way that we have the manpower to manually enter all of that information. So if it's worth it to you to be in on a drawing, just take a minute and fill out the form. Hopefully that makes sense. So this this show today, I want to talk about the importance of our participation with God, that fully engaged, keep your heart in it kind of faith, but also the sometimes hard to understand ways of God. And this is from my book, Closer Than Your Next Breath, and it's a story that I tell out of scripture, but I write it in story form to hopefully bring this story to life. This is maybe a hard to understand story for some. I'm hoping by the time we're done here, you've got some clarity. Once upon a time, A particular city was on friendly terms with Israel, but over time it grew more wicked in its ways, greedy in its actions, and ungodly in its view towards God's people. A mom and her daughter lived in that city. The mom was brokenhearted because her daughter was tormented by evil spirits. I shudder to imagine the trauma this little one endured at the hands of the enemy and his wretched minions. Scripture doesn't give us the names of this mother and daughter, so let's call the woman Ariel and her little girl Bella. This is how I imagine this scene in Matthew 15, verses 21 to 28. Ariel Ariel had heard rumors about a man of compassion who healed the sick, and he delivered the oppressed. And he had come to town. Driven by her deep love for little Bella, Ariel frantically left her simple home, wove through the crowd, determined to find answers. Whenever she saw a familiar face, she grabbed fistfuls of their sleeves, pulled them close, and said, Tell me, do you know where he is, the healer? Where is he staying? She didn't stop to formulate a plan or consider the possible outcome for a woman who dared to barge unannounced into a gathering of men. For Bella's sake, Ariel determined to act now and deal with the consequences later. She bravely entered the home of strangers, crumbled into a heap at the feet of Jesus. She grabbed hold of his ankles and cried out, Please, sir, help my baby. She's tormented by an evil spirit. I've tried to help her, but she's captive. She's my little girl. Please help her. Throughout the Gospels, we see that Jesus' compassion compelled him to action. But it was his wisdom that caused him to delay. As I read the Gospel account of this woman, I was cheering for Ariel. I wanted Jesus to grab her hands, look her in the eye, vindicate her faith, and speak life into little Bella at that moment. But Jesus, always keeping the bigger picture in mind, had other plans. Since Ariel was a Gentile, born in uh, Syrian Phoenicia, part of the Roman Empire, Jesus told her, in essence, first I should feed the children, my own family, the Jews. It isn't right to take food from children and throw it to the dogs. Ouch. But you know what? There's more to this story. First, we see there's an order to the things of God. He has a purpose in his processes. Our story, our desperate needs are never just all about us. God answers our prayers when he'll get the most glory and can reach the most significant number of people with our story. You know, God is on a global rescue mission. He delights in every detail of your life, but he also knows who needs to hear your story and see your life before and after your breakthrough. I want to say that again because I think some of us need to hear it today. God is on a global rescue mission. He delights in every detail of your life. But he also knows who needs to hear your story and see your life before 
and after your breakthrough. Somebody got to text me an amen on that one. Yet sometimes God makes exceptions to his own rules. For example, Jesus turned water into wine when his time had not yet come. Why? Well, because Mary was his mother, and she had such fierce faith that even when Jesus told her it was too early for miracles, she turned to their servants and said, do whatever he tells you. I don't know, as a mother of boys, I love that moment in Scripture. Well, the prophecies foretold that the Messiah would come to God's chosen people. But there were hints in the Old Testament that this message of salvation would also, in due time, be available to Gentiles. Thankfully, the gospel opened to Gentiles and the whole world. Otherwise, most of us would be without hope. Even so, Jesus could have spoken in a kinder tone to Ariel, don't you think? But who's to say he didn't look at Ariel with kindness in his eyes? Maybe he even cracked a smile, opened his hands, and invited her to dialogue with him. Whatever Jesus did at that moment, his posture invited Ariel to move toward him, not away from him. She dared to engage with Jesus and lay hold of the promise he had for her. And here's a study note from my Life Application Bible. It says, on the surface, Jesus' words may seem harsh and unsympathetic, but the woman recognized them as wide open door to God's throne. Jesus did not use the negative term for, quote, dogs that referred to scavengers. That was a word sometimes used by Jews when they referred to Gentiles. Instead, no, he used the term for household pet. The woman took the cue and added to his analogy of pets under the family dining table. Listen to this. Her attitude was expectant and hopeful, not prickly or hypersensitive. She knew what she wanted, and she believed Jesus could provide. We could learn from this woman's singular purpose and optimistic resilience. Don't you love that? Jesus really does want to meet our needs. When when we pray, we're talking to a friend. End quote. You know, years ago, I spoke with John Eldridge about the Syrophoenician woman, and he suggested that Jesus' words to her were more for the disciples than for her. Jesus intended to answer this woman's plea, but he also wanted to teach his followers an important lesson. Eldridge thinks that Jesus knew the Syrophoenician woman had a feisty faith enough and could handle the banter of their exchange, that his purpose for the seemingly harsh words were to challenge the disciples' prejudices instead. Well, somehow, Ariel discerned an opening, an opportunity to challenge the status quo and to lay hold of the miracle she desperately needed. When Jesus told Ariel he needed to feed his own family first, she quickly replied, well, that's true, Lord. But even the dogs under the table are allowed to eat the scraps from the children's plates. I love her. Jesus was so moved by her humble persistence that he granted her request. I imagine that moment when Jesus opened his hands, smiled, and said, Great answer. Go home to your little girl. That demon has left her. I picture tears escaping Ariel's eyes as she covered her face with her hands. Her cheeks flushed at the thought of the miracle her family had just experienced. She headed out the door, turned one last time, thanked Jesus for his kindness, and ran home without stopping. She entered her home breathless, only to find sweet Bella resting and at peace. Sometimes faith compels us to step outside the cultural norms to experience God. Wouldn't you say the same about the woman with the issue of blood as we read the Gospels? People expected her to stay home and live in isolation. Yet she tried that and it only made things worse. She stepped out of her small story, pressed through the crowds, grabbed hold of Jesus' hem, and her life was forever changed. And we're still talking about her today. You know, waiting for the other shoe to drop... It's terrible for our health. It's terrible for our brain and our spiritual life. And it's in direct conflict with the promises of God. Search the scriptures for verses about God's goodness, and you'll find that they're often connected to the invitation to trust and wait and believe. So at some point, we need to trust God to be good. It's a vulnerable leap when you've suffered long. I know that. Moreover, sometimes we're called to move past static trust to boldly wrestle with God, not because he's withholding a blessing, but because we've got to wrestle through our reluctance to trust him. Every one of our not yet seasons reveals our buried beliefs about God and ourself. And I want to say that again. Every one of our not yet seasons reveals something about our buried beliefs about God and ourselves and our opinions about both often change with the season. God knows what's in us, but he wants us to know what's in us, so we'll learn to better trust him. 
Perhaps the more we trust him, the more we'll experience his presence and begin to truly believe that he is good. And the more we trust his goodness, the greater our story becomes. Not only for us, but for the many who are desperate to know that the one who put the stars in place is ultimately working all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Romans eight twenty six twenty eight in the Message Translation reads this way. Meanwhile, the moment we get tired in the waiting, God's Spirit is right alongside, helping us along. If we don't know how or what to pray, it doesn't matter. He does our praying in and for us, making prayer out of our wordless sighs and our aching groans. He knows us far better than we know ourselves, knows our pregnant condition, and keeps us present before God. That's why we can be so sure that every detail in our lives of love for God is worked into something good. So here's my challenge uh, as we step away from this segment. I challenge you to refrain from making negative assessments and statements about yourself, God, your circumstances, and others. Maybe fast from that this whole holiday season. Suspend judgment. Just stop making negative assessments. Instead, train your eyes and your thoughts to actively look for God's movement in your life. Immerse yourself in passages that speak of God's strength and his power, his goodness, and his kindness. In a particularly tough season, that discipline will serve you incredibly well. God asks that we suspend judgment in the short term and dare to believe that he's kinder than we ever imagined and more purposeful with our story than we can possibly fathom. Remember the story about our girl, Ariel? She wasn't hypersensitive or prickly. She possessed singular focus and optimistic resilience. May we set our faces like Flint to the one who knows us, loves us, and is moving heaven and earth right now on our behalf. My prayer for you and for me is that we could maintain an optimistic resilience. I love that phrase. We'll be back in a minute. Thanks so much for tuning in to Suzy Larson Live. I'm Suzy, and I'm so grateful to have you here today. If you're new to this show and today's the first time you've tuned in, welcome. So glad to have you. Normally, I'm interviewing a guest, but every once in a while, I'll take the show and just fill the space as I feel led. And we're taking Fridays of this month to draw content from my Advent devotional, Prepare Him Room, and from other sources as well, but just to help prepare some space in your life for Jesus, to celebrate that he came, to anticipate that he's coming. Thanks to Bethany House, my publisher of Prepare Him Room. They're offering a handful of copies of this beautiful book, and I can say that because they did a gorgeous job with it, and I, I just love it. I do. I love this book. It's precious to me. Anyway, so grateful to be able to give a handful of copies away each Friday, thanks to them. You can text the word book to 877-933-2484. Today's show is really all about the sometimes hard to understand ways of Jesus and the absolute utter necessity of our participation in this kingdom story, our engagement with God, our keeping our hearts in it and not phoning it in, not checking it out or checking out, not loosening our grip on the promises of God. And too easy, that's the norm. You know, we don't default to places of faith, hope, and love. We default to to fear, discouragement, despair to apathy, to disengagement, to isolation, and then we blame God. But he is here. He's Emmanuel, right here, right now. We have access to his presence. We have access to his promises. He's made a a promise to provide and deliver and defend us. We are the ones who drift. He's right here, right now. So again, my hope and prayer is these Friday shows help you engage with a fresh awe and wonder Because the king of the universe, the one who merely spoke and the heavens came to be, loves you. He knows about every detail of your life. He knows your deepest secrets, the things you try to hide. He knows the way you cope with your pain. He loves you. And he wants you to go from strength to strength, glory to glory, shining ever brighter till the full light of day. Well, this, uh, this portion is from day three of Prepare Him Room. And uh, I tell the story about how we got pregnant on our honeymoon. Maybe you know that of our story. And this twist in our story startled us because we were going to wait five years to have kids. 
But had we waited five years, we would not have been able to have kids. I learned during my first pregnancy that I had something called endometriosis and would need a hysterectomy in my late 20s. So we had our three boys right away, uh, surrounded by lots of crisis, bed rest, you know, uh, respiratory issues, all kinds of things. But here it is. We got pregnant on our honeymoon, and this twist truly startled us. And we delivered our firstborn son days before Christmas. I remember nestling him close by the light of our Charlie Brown Christmas tree, and my soul flooded with delight. I did. I gazed at that miracle in my arms. I looked around at our tiny home. I pondered all we needed to do to make room for this little boy. I'd do anything for him. Our lives would never be the same. I was just about to write the old cliche, no one prepared me for this journey of motherhood. But, you know, I think a more accurate statement is this. I had no idea what I was in for. The love, the worry, the fear, the heartbreak, the triumphs. No clue. But I wasn't ill prepared. God used my journey to prepare me. Whenever we ask for more from God, he asks for more from us. And this is from Luke's Gospel, chapter 3. John went from place to place on both sides of the Jordan River, preaching that people should be baptized to show that they repented of their sins and turned to God to be forgiven. Isaiah had spoken of John when he said, He is a voice shouting in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. The valleys will be filled and the mountains and hills made level. The curves will be straightened and the rough places made smooth. Then all people will see the salvation sent from God. Wow. John shouting to the crowds, prepare the way for the Lord. Prepare? How? What did he mean? Did he expect them to rush home, get their act together, come back another day for their baptism? What did John mean when he charged people to clear the way for Jesus? Well, with a booming voice and deep conviction, John urged people to acknowledge their need for a Savior, to own their sin, to look honestly at their heart and life condition. You'll never be free from a sin you refuse, to, you refuse to recognize. Ultimately, John was saying something like this. Prepare to change. Don't just rush into the waters of baptism to escape hell. Acknowledge your need for a Savior. Repent of your sin. You prepare a way for the Lord in your life when you give Him room to work on you and in you and to change you from the inside out. Are you ready to turn from your selfish, simple ways to follow Jesus on His terms? Are you ready for such a radical lifestyle change? This is not your work. You can't do it for yourself. It's the work of Christ within you, your hope of glory. Make no mistake. He will bring the high places low. He will humble you and dismantle your ego. He will lift the heavy burden from your shoulders and even carry you when you're too weary to walk on your own. He'll put you right where you're thinking wrong. He'll not only save your soul, he'll transform you into someone you never dreamed you could be. But the road won't be easy. You won't feel feel prepared for such a journey. But Jesus will prepare you for all he has for you. Salvation is not an escape route out of hell. It's the radical redemption of your life. So you might ask, what should I do? Well, the crowds ask the same question. But here's what's true. God deals differently with all of us. He urged some to give out of their excess to the poor. If you have extra, give some to the poor. He told the corrupt tax collectors to quit swindling people out of their money. If you've been cheating others, you should stop doing so immediately. He charged the soldiers to quit misusing their power. Maybe you're in a position of influence and you've leveraged your role in your favor. If so, ask God for forgiveness and begin to do the opposite. Use your power to make life better for others. Christmas probably isn't the best time to bring up Sodom's sins, but I can't help myself. Though most of us know the city of Sodom for her sexual immorality, Scripture records it this way. Now this was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. They did not help the poor and the needy. Wow. Arrogant, overfed, unconcerned with the poor and the needy, while they suffered just outside Sodom's door? Another translation lists her sins this way, pride, gluttony, apathy. Easy to judge such a wicked city, right? But if I'm honest, I've overthought about myself or maybe not thought enough of others too many times to count. I've indulged in more than I needed, and I've turned a blind eye on a need that was well within my reach to meet. God have mercy. 
I don't want to live that way. Jesus made room for us in his heart, in his family, and at his table. He's gone away to prepare a spectacular place for us that no mind can imagine. He makes room for us every day by putting his time, energy, and attention into our lives. Think about that. Every day, God puts time, energy, intention, and love into your story. Whether you can't see it or feel it or you can, he's doing it. He's a good father. How might we do the same for him? Well, we prepare him room. We give him some time and space to speak to us about our lives. We're humble enough to let him correct and direct, to guide and provide. You know, Scripture says that we see as in a glass dimly, which means we're all blind about some things. What if one of the ways that you prepared room for God this season is, said, is to pray, show me where I'm blind. Show me what I can't see. Show me how the people around me feel about my presence in their lives. Do I make them feel overlooked? Do I make them feel loved and seen? Show me what I can't see. I want to see clearly. God is gracious. He's a loving and giving God. And in Christ Jesus, we are uncondemnable. Is that not amazing? That's why you can dare to ask the question, show me what I can't see. Because there is now and never will be no condemnation for you if you are in Christ Jesus. So you can come under the shining light of his presence. You can dare to say, search me, O God. Know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts and point out anything in me that offends you and lead me in your everlasting way. You can talk about that with God and never get condemnation from him. Even though that verse applies, there are things in you that offend him, that grieve the spirit. And how much more intimacy will you have with God when you bring it up? I mean, picture a married couple, and one of the spouses is like saying, you know, I don't want to talk about it because it'll just make her mad. But what if you move towards your spouse and said, I've been distant, I've been inattentive, I've been working too much. She already knows that. So what if you said it? You know what would happen? Greater intimacy. Well, what if you did that with God? Knowing that he puts time, space, energy, and love into your story, what if you made some space to say, tell me what I can't see? You are uncondemnable. Your sin will never condemn you. Jesus is alive in you. His spirit wants to transform you from the inside out, but he'll never force the process. It requires our access, our participation. Will you trust him? He's totally worthy of our trust. We'll be back in a minute. This is Suzy Larson, host of Suzy Larson Live. You know, I learned a valuable lesson while walking through one of the deep valleys of the shadow in my life. Our hearts can't live without hope. And we have reason for hope because Jesus is with us in every season of life. Using the word hope as an acronym, I want to remind you of four very important truths when it comes to hope. That God is a healer. One way or another, he will heal and redeem your story. O is you are meant to overcome. P is you have a purpose and a calling. And E, God wants you to live with eternity in mind. If you're struggling to make it to the next moment, text the word HOPE to get a fresh dose of hope. We are here to help you and walk with you through this journey. You can text 877-933-2484. Welcome back to Suzy Larson Live. I'm Suzy, and I'm so grateful for this time with you today. We're taking our Friday show and just devoting it to content from my book, Prepare Him Room. It's an Advent devotional and other uh, sources as well, just some stories from my past history with the whole goal being to give you some time and space and even making the case for you to prepare him room. He's worth your time. He's worth your space. In fact, nobody loves you like he does. Nobody can give you revelation about your past, your present, and your future like God can. I've been pondering different passages of Scripture that talk about that he confides in those who fear him. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, The secret things belong to the Lord, but the things he reveals to us, well, they belong to us and to our children forever. It also says in Scripture, he confides in those who fear him. Jeremiah 33, 3, Call on me and I will tell you great and mighty things you do not know about the days to come. He invites us to intimacy and fellowship, and he wants to show us and reveal to us things we could not otherwise know. 
He is our greatest gift, and the enemy would bait us into a busyness that drains us because he's terrified of a fellowship with God that would transform us. Well, a big shout out to my publisher for Prepare Him Room, Bethany House Publishers. I love this book. I think it's just gorgeous inside and out, and I I have to say I love the content, and I can only say that because God gave it to me. We worked in partnership, and I just love how it turned out. We've got a handful of copies to give away each Friday, and you can enter the drawing by texting the word book to 877-933-2484. And today's show is really devoted to some Jesus kind of sometimes seemingly hard to understand ways, but also the importance of our participation, our full engagement. And though God calls us to seasons in battle and seasons of rest, he never calls us to seasons of autopilot where we phone it in or we lay our weapons down. We worship him. We stay uh, in battle stance, so to speak, with our shoes of peace, our belt of truth, our breastplate of righteousness, our helmet of salvation, our shield of faith and the sword of the spirit. And all of those pieces of armor really speak to part of your God-given identity, that the shoes of peace that God has equipped you uh, to really stomp out the enemy and to keep peace in all circumstances, and that you're equipped to go where he sends you. That belt of truth, that's different than the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of truth. The belt of truth speaks, it holds up all the other armor on, but it's living up to what you already know. Living a life of integrity holds the armor on, not living a duplicit life, but that belt of truth, living up to what you already know, is part of our God-given calling. And that breastplate of righteousness, that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You step into Jesus' status and identity. What Jesus won for you and did for you allows you to stand before God as if you've never sinned, as if you always obeyed. That's what God sees when he looks at you. He sees through the filter of Jesus' sacrifice for you. You are an heir of God. The, the helmet of salvation is to have the mind of Christ and to keep an eternal perspective in mind. The shield of faith is to block every fiery dart of the enemy, which, you know what, just because you're on vacation doesn't mean the enemy is on vacation. We've got to know instinctively how to say, that's not going in. That fiery dart aimed to hurt me this holiday season, I'm not taking it. You need your shield. And the sword of the Spirit is your weapon of offense. It's your one weapon to go get other people free from the bondages that enslave them as well. I didn't in- tend to kind of go there with the weapons of our warfare, but I I just did. So if you want to learn more about that, immerse yourself in the book of Ephesians, specifically chapter 6 is on the warfare, the weapons of our warfare. But I want to wrap today's show talking about Christmas traditions, about, again, Jesus' upside-down way. When he came, you know, he turned the world on its head. And this is from one of the days uh, in Prepare Him Room. The chapter is titled, The Kingdom is Yours. Christmas traditions can add such richness to our holiday seasons, but when we idolize tradition at the expense of those entrusted to our care, we become a little like the Pharisees, and we need a fresh encounter with the one who gives life and breath to every living thing. The Pharisees had developed expectations around their interpretations. We, too, develop expectations at Christmas time because of our interpretations of what a festive holiday should look like. This isn't about semantics. It's really the difference between fighting for our way and finding the Jesus way. After Jesus' confrontation with the Pharisees, he stole away for a while to spend time with his father. He then chose his disciples and came down to a level place where a vast multitude waited to hear what he had to say. Once again, Jesus turned their expectations upside down, and he showed them the way to real life, real power, and kingdom love. And this is from Luke's Gospel, chapter 6. And looking toward his disciples, he began speaking, Blessed, spiritually prosperous, happy to be admired are you who are poor in spirit, those devoid of spiritual arrogance and those who regard themselves as insignificant. For the kingdom of God is yours, both now and forever. Blessed, joyful, nourished by God's goodness are you who hunger now for righteousness, actively seeking right standing with God, for you will be completely satisfied. Blessed, forgiven, refreshed by God's grace are you who weep now over your sins and repent. For you will laugh when the burden of sin is lifted. That's the Amplified Translation. In Jesus' day, ego was king. It was a sign of virtue. Then comes the king of the new and everlasting kingdom. He modeled humility. He teaches love. He leads by example. In his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus dismantles worldly ways and offers an otherworldly way to live. Look at what the masses do, and you can almost always assume that Jesus will do the opposite. 
Have you noticed it? Expectations and entitlement reek of pride and self-indulgence. In this passage, Jesus calls you supremely blessed and much to be admired when you know where you'd be without him. To be poor in spirit is to know your limits and understand your needs. We're all desperate for more of Jesus. We don't all just know it yet. (laughs) One day we will, though. When you come to the edges of yourself and your self-life shows, like you're acting grabby or grumpy or entitled or selfish or annoyed, don't come under condemnation because, again, there's no condemnation for you if you're in Christ Jesus. Instead, come to Jesus. Admit where you've fallen or failed. Confess your need. Ask for his grace and forgiveness. Then rise with great joy because you are to be admired. When you finally learn your limits, you're finally positioned to inherit more of the kingdom, of which there are no limits. As Christ followers, we serve in a right-side-up kingdom, but we're living in an upside-down world, wouldn't you say? Read Jesus' words in this sermon, self-indulgent laughter. I want you to picture the overfed, overindulged, laughing at someone else's expense. Well, that will end. Their season of sin will turn on its head. But for those who've been battling in the shadows, who've mourned over their sin and the sin of their land, who've offered sacrifices of praise that cost them dearly, well, their sacrifices of praise will become banquets of thanksgiving. That day is coming, friend. Giving gifts to the already rich is, well, fine, but offering gifts to those who cannot repay you is sacred. You want to turn the Christmas season right side up? Give generously and thoughtfully to someone who doesn't expect a gift from you. Give another such gift to someone who's not been kind to you. Surprise them with the goodness of God, for he is kind to both the ungrateful and the wicked. That's what scripture says. When humble awe and wonder replace arrogance and entitlement, the kingdom is yours. I want you to hear that again. When humble awe and wonder replace arrogance and entitlement, The kingdom is yours. When you feel sorry for your sin without crumbling under a heap of despair or condemnation, but instead you rise with a new joy in your salvation, the kingdom is yours. When you ponder God's kindness to you, and then you extend that same grace to those who seem least deserving, the kingdom is yours. Jesus reminds us at the end of his sermon that a tree is known by its fruit. What's in our lives hangs on our tree. May the kingdom of God come to your home this holiday season. And here's the prayer. Mighty Savior, Redeemer and friend, how do I ever thank you enough, let alone comprehend all you won for me? I fall to my knees, open my hands, and look up with fresh awe and wonder. You saved me. You loved me. I belong to you. I'm no longer my own. Help me break free from rigid religion and stale traditions that keep me from offering life to those in need. This season is about your kingdom for your glory. I put it all on the table for you, Lord. Show me your way this season. I'm all in. Amen. And the fast for this particular day's reading, you decide if you want to take the challenge. Fast from self-contempt today. I dare you. Refuse to get stuck on your limits. Next, identify an unlikely someone and give them a generous and thoughtful gift. Someone who most likely cannot return the favor. Someone who will be surprised by your generosity. I'm telling you, friend, this is where it gets really fun. It's just so easy to get caught up in our story in the holiday season, but there are many people that God has appointed you to touch. God gave me a really creative, fun idea this year. When I'm out speaking, oftentimes they put a speaker's basket in my room, and most times because I have all these food issues and can't eat what they're serving everybody else, but there'll be some, you know, gluten-free bars in there and, you know, corn chips and an apple and things that I can eat, right? I always appreciate that so much. And uh, But I've got these baskets, and um, I felt like the Lord said, instead of uh, packing those away or sending those to Goodwill, I want you to fill those for people in need, and I'll let you know one by one who they are. What a fun adventure. And so I just kept looking at those baskets, and first first person, I get a call from a couple of my kids who are ministering to someone who's hurting, whose life has been turned upside down this season. And so I went and filled that basket. While I was doing that, I instantly knew the next person, someone in my neighborhood, 
who lost her spouse. I'm still waiting on the others, but you know, it was kind of a failure. I filled this basket. Kevin and I wrote a nice letter to her and just dropped it on her doorstep, the second gal. We're here if you need us. <laughs> we went home. No phone number. We didn't leave our email, nothing. Like, how was she ever going to find us? What in the world? So it was still a beautiful basket, <laughs> but I'm learning as I go. But the point being, I bet God has a divine assignment for you outside your comfort zone. And Lord Jesus, I pray, show my friend what it is, who it is, what they can do. Bring provision, open the doors, and change this Christmas holiday season. Lord God, we invite you to upend our Christmas so that it becomes sacred and kingdom-like and not commercialized in any way. Holy Spirit, we receive you. Let earth receive her king. I pray you found some encouragement here today. I love and appreciate you so much. We'll meet you back here next time. Thanks for listening to Suzy Larson Live. Podcasts like mine are available because of your support. If it's important to you to hear things that encourage your faith, click the link in the show notes and give now.